glass of milk. This dog. WrestleMania 32 main event. Well, at least it'll be better than Undertaker vs. Psycho Sid. And feature much less poop. Hello, my fellow Marks, and welcome to The Mark Remark, the silliest bastardization of sports entertainment since Hulk Hogan's rock and wrestling. My name's Martin, and ha, huh, that's gonna put some butts in the seats. <laughs> this week on Adventures of Cena the Hedgehog, the WWE starts off the show with a promotional video for the upcoming pay-per-view King of the Ring. That's right, they're bringing back the show that saw the genesis of such stars as Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bret the Hitman Hart. Oh wait, what's that? They're just holding the tournament on free television and the WWE Network. Well, I'm sure that means the real pay-per-view for this month will be something truly special. Uh, wait, what's that? It's, it's just WWE Payback. Really? Payback? Uh, 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 payback? You're fucking lying! Raw is live from Green Bay, Wisconsin, the home of Mr. Kennedy! And just like Mr. Kennedy, this week's show is guaranteed to excite the WWE Universe, until Randy Orton shows up and ruins everything. But before that can happen, the WWE Champion Jeff Goldblum comes out, accompanied by Jam Jars and Coco Krispies. He tells us that he's smarter than everybody, and he used an SKO to defeat Randy at Extreme Rules. Apparently, this this is how he got away with blatantly breaking the rules in the main event the night before by putting an S in front of the RKO's name. I think it was William Shakespeare that once wrote, an RKO by any other name would still be fucking banned. Seth refers to Kane as the Crypt Keeper, which is highly fucking insulting. To the Crypt Keeper, I mean. Even a puppet doesn't act nearly as wooden as Kane does. This is far too much for Kane to handle, and not only does he call Seth Rollins a brat, he also compares him to Justin Bieber, which is frankly ludicrous. Seth Rollins is a young performer whose success has been ensured by a slimy corporate organization and continues to find fame and glory despite not putting any effort into it and being a giant prick, which means he's nothing like Justin Bieber. Hmm. Seth Rollins is so upset, he insists that Kane must just be jealous, sounding like a 14-year-old DeviantArt user in the process. Original championship do not steal. Sandy Toxvig interrupts the proceedings. He then demands another title shot, because that's just what we need. Randy Orton in the main event picture still, again, continuing to do that. Yay. Roman Reigns arrives as well, or as Booker T would call him... Superman is in the building! Hey, hang on, that's not John Cena! No, Roman Reigns is the next John Cena! It's an important distinction to make. Roman hasn't brought his mild smugness tonight. No, this time it's wild smugness. It's out of control. Look at him stand on the announce table. That smugness is beyond compare. Roman declares that he beat the authorities' giant, which means he deserves a title shot. Which is strange because as the greatest giant in history, TM, the big show was supposed to lose anyway. It's hardly an achievement, Roman. This leaves Kane with quite the pickle. If Randy's here, and Roman's here, who's going to get the title shot? Well, whatever the case, he makes a tag team match with them for the main event, because that's what you do in the WWE when you have no idea what to do. You make a tag team match. Seriously, I hear that's how they decide who gets the last slice of pizza. The King of the Ring tournament has begun. Mortal Kombat. It's Solf J. Kimbley versus Bed Bath & Beyond. Dolph calls what Sheamus did to him at Extreme Rules the most humiliating moment of his entire career, apparently forgetting about his run as a member of the Spirit Squad. Bad news. Barrett tells us that he will be the ruler, which I can only assume means he will become 30 centimeters tall and help small children draw straight lines on their homework. This admittedly would be far more prestigious than his run as Intercontinental Champion. The announcers discuss whether Dolph's head is in the match. How does Dolph Ziggler concentrate tonight after what had to be the most humiliating and embarrassing moment of his career no, last night? nothing he's gonna have to do but go out here and do the job. 
Spooka! Don't spoil the ending for everybody! Ziggler is distracted by Sheamus appearing on the ramp, because as we all know, the moment your rival comes out during your match, you immediately have no choice but to argue with them until someone hits their finisher on you. And so Bad News Barrett wins! Better luck next time, Nikki! The New Day arrive as the new tag team champions, and they thank their clappers for support! And much like clappers, the crowd are quite turned off by the sound of the New Day. They try to introduce a new clap, New Day rocks, but the fans are not buying it. Perhaps you should try something a little more honest, guys. Something like New Day are extremely limited by a lackluster gimmick, but are okay, I guess. But will probably break up the moment the fans get behind them. Like I said, a work in progress. Just a reminder that John Cena will fight Rusev for the 1200th time at Payback, this time in an I Quit match. Which is ironic, because it seems like the WWE doesn't want to quit having them wrestle each other. Next up is Baxter Stockman versus Oh, Fort Lauderdale. We're getting a match between these two after their exciting encounter at Extreme Rules. Exciting encounter, of course, being slang for last minute filler segment. Bo Dallas calls the Green Bay fans cheese heads. The nerve! Everybody knows that the average Green Bay head is 65% organic tofu. Ryback wins after hitting Bo with Shell Shocked, the finisher with a completely nonsensical name. Is Ryback supposed to be a Ninja Turtle? Was he trained in the sewers by a talking rat in the art of actually fucking hurting your opponent? Maybe all this time he's been saying, feed me more, he actually wanted a pizza. We could have saved a lot more innocent jobbers if we just called Domino's. After the match, Bray Wyatt teleports in from Dimension X and gives Ryback Sister Abigail. I mean, the wrestling move. He didn't just hand over his sibling as a human sacrifice to Ryback. I hope. I guess Ryback is going to be Bray's next opponent, making Wyatt the Shredder to Ryback's Leonardo. Better watch out for trash compactors, Bray. Also Megan Fox. John Cena comes out to address Rusev. He makes allusions to Lana being a prostitute, because that's exactly what a heroic babyface is supposed to do. Insinuate that a woman is a sex worker. He follows these uncomfortable allegations with a frantic bout of patriotism. America! Bald Eagles! Apple Pie and Big Macs! Jerry Bruckheimer! He's also very insistent that this match will be the last time these two square off. Payback is the final chapter between Rusev and John Cena. Yes, I bet. This will be the last chapter of the franchise for certain. In unrelated news, Markiplier will be the guest commentator for this match. It's that terrible. Beef Patty comes out to answer John Cena's open challenge. To show how serious he is, Heath does the unthinkable. Insult the local sports teams. What? A professional wrestler mocks the athletic organization of the town that they're currently in? New ground has been broken here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. How can you possibly top this injustice? Rusev is so upset that a fellow heel would go this far that he kicks the ginger right off of Slater's head. Head. Lana tries to appeal to the WWE Universe because she suddenly wants to for some reason, and Rusev channels Vince McMahon by sending her off of TV for getting people to like her of their own accord. Rusev has some very choice words for John Cena. <laughs> All right, Rusev. We won't date your llama, and neither will the chimera made up of Sabu, yourself, and John Cena. Human transmutation has gone too far. The fans start chanting, we want llama, just to spite Rusev. What's that? Oh, they're chanting, we want Lana. Well, that doesn't make any sense. He was just talking about his llama. Pay more attention, WWE Universe. Also, he's going to make John Cena say, I quit, apparently. Little does Rusev know, John Cena doesn't know the meaning of the word quit. He had to forget that move when he learned the springboard stunner. Kane and Seth Rollins are backstage, and the champion echoes the sentiments of the internet wrestling community by protesting the idea of Roman Reigns and Randy Orton getting title shots. He asks Kane if he's out of his mind, and Kane replies, Maybe I am, which would be in keeping with somebody who's in charge of WWE decision making. He then announces that the WWE Universe can choose who Seth's opponent will be at payback, providing that it's Roman Reigns, Randy Orton, or both. Both of them at the same time. Phew. For a moment there, I thought the WWE was actually going to let their fans choose what they want to see at the pay-per-view. But no! It's Orton or Reigns or fuck you, you get both of them. The King of the Ring tournament continues. R-Type takes on Star Platinum and R-Truth has this to say before the match. My first royal order would be get rid of all spiders. Big, small, 
Smedium? Yes, Smedium spiders. Those are the worst. Almost as bad as the Blarge ones. It also seems that our truth is under the illusion that when you are king, you hold actual power. If anything, it just means you will eventually become an awful commentator. Our truth demonstrates his athletic skills by getting the win after the two opponents just sort of bump into each other. Apparently, his new finisher is just as clumsy as his promo skills. JBL spreads hate speech. Hashtag no more spiders. Not sure I care for your anti-arachnid agenda, John. We're starting to sound like JBL Jonah Jameson here. Jerry Springer will be hosting WWE Too Hot for TV. Because just like Jerry Springer, the WWE also hasn't been relevant since the 90s. Fandango faces Adam Rose! Again! JBL makes an interesting comparison. How would you describe uh, Adam Rose then? He'd be a cross between who? <laughs> cross between one of Austin Myers, uh, Mike Myers creatures from Austin Powers on acid, somehow stuck in the year 2015. Sorry, did I say interesting? I meant incredibly stupid. Yes, Adam Rose is definitely like all of Mike Myers' characters from Austin Powers. At once. Because that's possible. Dr. Fat Gold member Evil Powers Bastard gets the win when Rosa Mendez, women, distracts Fandango. Or more precisely, makes out on Adam Rose in a really uncomfortable looking way. I think I have a reverse boner right now. Speaking of reasons to go limp, Daniel Bryan was not medically cleared to wrestle at Extreme Rules. Renee Young asks Brie Bella about Daniel's health, and despite talking about a legitimate real-life situation that affects them both personally, she still fails to express an ounce of emotion. Naomi drops Brie like a sack of potatoes and claims that nobody cares about her or her husband. Well, at least she's half right. This causes a match to happen to us. Cheese Bella quickly loses as Naomi Naomi debuts her new finisher, the incredibly sloppy Inside Cradle. Truly amazing. King of the Ring keeps happening. I warned you about tournaments, bro. I told you, dog. It's Dean Ambrose versus Sheamus, or as I like to call it, the Lunatic Fringe versus the Psychopathic Mohawk. Dean says that under his rule, all legal matters will be settled in street fights. I'm sure Matt Murdock would agree that crazy avocado at law. Booker T shares his expert analysis of Sheamus. The shame is, of course, he's been to the dance. I mean, former world heavyweight champion, former king of the ring, and a, just a big Viking dude who just loves to scrap. Yes, Sheamus is now an Irish Scottish Norse wrestler. Forget too many limes, he's got too many homelands. Damien Mizdow is here. Oh, that's right, you're going by your real name now. Sorry about that. Aaron Stephen Haddad is here. What's that? Oh, oh not that one. Okay. Idol Stevens then? Oh, Damien Sandow. Right, okay. The man of a million names cuts a pretty good worked shoot about his career in the WWE, actually. Of course, all of the goodwill presented by this admittedly quite positive segment is flushed straight down the toity when Curtis Axel <laughs> shows up to berate him. Sandow gives him what for by copying everything he says like a 12-year-old boy. But I can assure you that this idea seemed extremely witty and hilarious when the creative team first hurriedly scribbled it onto a napkin five minutes before the show. The Shrekter Bray Wyatt is being creepy and weird backstage. In a Move that shocks everybody in attendance. He tells Ryback that he knows what he's scared of. What, wellness violations? Being forced to learn wrestling moves? April O'Neil not putting out? In the final King of the Ring match of the night, it's Neville versus Luke Harper. Or as I like to call it, the man that gravity forgot versus the man who forgot to shower. Luke Harper has interesting plans for his would-be kingdom. My reign of terror is coming to WWE. Reign of Tear? What does that mean? Is he going to open a tear into an alternate reality where he's a well-shaven, well-spoken businessman? Or one where the Wyatt family was booked well? Or one where Booker T was actually the villain all along? Speaking of our Troy Baker voice protagonist, he has an interesting call to make. Harper with an uppercut. 
Good old American uppercut what? right there. Ah, yes, the American uppercut. Not to be confused with the European uppercut. This one comes in a larger portion and is wrapped in bacon. Even ham-fisted offense can't stop Neville, however, and he takes the victory after a British shooting star press. It's like a regular shooting star press, only much wetter. Now, in the words of Todd Grisham, screw this fake crap I'm going to call real sports. Oh, uh, sorry, I mean, it's time for the main event. As the tag team match in Use, Michael Cole has some harsh words for our WWE champion. In fact, without Kane, Seth Rollins would have never been the Money in the Bank winner. Oh, come on. What Look, say oh, come on, John. Come on. You know it. You that called the That is the, the most match. revisionist history. You ought to work for the oh, Onion. Man. Well, yes, I'll admit that Michael Cole does spout laughable hyperbole, but the Onion is a satire of news journalism that people take far too seriously. Whereas Michael Cole is a joke of a journalist that people can't take seriously. Well, they don't really gel. Apparently, neither do Kane and Seth Rollins, as the champion keeps accidentally attacking Kane, which causes Kane to get angrier than Big Show at a crowded catering table. He takes out J&J &J security and leads Seth Rollins right into an Aquaman punch from Roman Reigns and an SKO from Randy Orton. And with that mess out of the way, we finally find out what the fans want to see in the WWE Championship match at Payback. And it turns out that they've picked the lesser of three evils and made it a triple threat. Yes, the WWE Universe has spoken. Or at least selected from a set of very limited options anyway. Honestly, they'll have to make do with that. Next up, we have the remainder of of the King of the Ring in this WWE Network exclusive broadcast live from an undisclosed location. No, seriously, they didn't say where this is being held, so. I guess we should just assume that the location is the WWE Network, since that's all Michael Cole will tell us. Remind me to book my next vacation to the WWE Network. After all, it only costs $9.99 a month. Jerry the King Lawler emerges from his sex dungeon. Finally, he's at an event where he's not completely out of place. He explains the format for tonight's proceedings before shambling down to the announce table to pretend that he knows anything about the men who will be wrestling tonight. Byron Saxton interviews Linus, who calls Neville an English elf. To be fair, those ears do certainly point out a bit. When Seamus becomes king, he will make all the little fellas in the WWE line up to kiss his ass. I'm sorry, but little fellas? Is that some sort of Irish, Scottish, Nordic euphemism for a penis? Because that's all I'm going to hear it as going forward. Renee Young then interviews Super Mario Brothers The Lost Levels. He tells us that he will show Seamus what a little fella can do. Probably best to keep it in your pants, Neville. People have been arrested for whipping their little fella out in public. The first semi-final is up. The announcers make some interesting comparisons. Greatest Irish king since Brian Baru. He'd be the next Loch Ness Monster, wouldn't he? Now, in Jerry's defense, Seamus has proven to be at least a third Scottish. Also, I can't believe I just defended Jerry Lawler. During the match, Seamus yells that little fellas don't belong in the ring. Well, that hasn't stopped John Cena from wrestling all these years. Dolph Ziggler comes out to distract Seamus, having learned firsthand the jobber mind trick of showing up during your rival's match. And this lets Neville take the win. Not bad for a tiny cock. Uh, sorry, I mean little fella. After the match, Ziggler and Sheamus get into a legitimately cool brawl, and Sheamus gets busted wide open. Now, if this was on WWE TV, you wouldn't see this. But here on the WWE Network, blood flows freely, and little fellas bounce around the place like nature intended. Backstage, Bad News Barrett calls our truth a has been, leading most of the WWE fan base to wonder when he ever was. As for truth, he's confident he'll win tonight. I'll be the Kang right here, you know what I'm saying? I'll be the Kang. You mean like Liu Kang? I mean, I suppose he won a tournament. I hope this means his new finisher will be transforming into an arcade cabinet and crushing his opponent. We see tweets from former kings, Bret Hart and Booker T. And this is probably the only time you'll hear those two names mentioned in the same breath. As the champion of Earth Realm and Barrett face off, JBL makes a good case for R-Truth becoming king. Nero played a musical instrument and true dances. There's precedence for truth being a ruler. Hey now, this is supposed to be about kings, not presidents. Honestly, I don't know how you got those two mixed up. Unfortunately, all the presidents in the world can't stop our truth from losing. Thanks, Obama. This leads to the final. Neville versus Barrett. Two Englishmen will fight for the right to be king. I'm sure the queen herself would be very proud. If she weren't actually German, that is. Triple H tweets that King of the Ring winners have gone on to win the WWE Championship and headline WrestleMania. This is quite true, but do you know who else was a King of the Ring winner? Mr. Ass. So whoever wins this...
Good luck. The two men have quite the battle, which ends when Bad News Barrett hits Neville with the bull hammer. Cleanly. And then he gets coronated as King Barrett. And, and that's it. The show's over. No faffing about. The faff is practically non-existent. Oh, that was... Oh, that was a wrestling show that focused on professional wrestling. I don't know how to feel about that. Where were the irrelevant celebrities? The, the rambling 20-minute promos? The little person dressed like a bull? There was none of that. It's just wrestling. No, no, this is weird. I'm scared, WWE. Scared and confused. Thankfully, SmackDown is next, which I'm sure will return us to our regularly scheduled faff. Ah, here it is. Kane and Seth Rollins have a petty argument in the back. Nonetheless, Kane has big plans for the champion. And so help me, I'm gonna make a man out of you if it's the last thing that I ever do. It's what's best for business to defend your belt. Kick the ass of Orton, Roman Reigns as well. You may not have your curb stomp, cause concussions get us sued. But still I'll make a champ out of you. A small child has stolen his daddy's suit and snuck into Michael Cole's place on the commentary team tonight. Luckily, nobody seems to be able to tell the difference. Roman Reigns is on his way to the ring. Just what level of smugness will he bring to the table tonight? Well, if we look at the smugometer, we can see that his smug level has dropped from an 8 to a 5. All right, calm down, everybody. Roman Reigns is back to mild smugness. We're going Going to survive. Roman doesn't get to smug us for very long until Kane arrives and starts unbuttoning his shirt. Well then, I guess the fire still burns after all if you catch my drift. Oh wait, never mind. He's going to wrestle with Roman Reigns. That's why he took his top off, so that he could wrestle with the other sweaty gentleman. Nothing sexual about that, I can assure you. Kane is out here to prove that he is still relevant in the WWE, but when he realizes this means he will have to actually have a wrestling match, he promptly leaves. Damien Sandow is in the impact zone, ready to take on all comers. Oh, sorry, my mistake. That's just usually what happens when a WWE superstar loses the rights to their ring name. No, instead he's going to be wrestling Curtis Axel and spends the entire match mocking the man who's already a walking joke at this point. Damien Sandow wins, proving once again that hard work, perseverance, and not being the Miz is the recipe for success. Ryback versus Luke Harper is next. The announcers have clearly done their research. It comes from where he lives, down the swamps. Where, 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 where is it? Is it like New Orleans or somewhere near that? No idea. Excellent journalism there, guys. Though to be fair, the lead play-by-play -play is an eight-year-old boy. Ryback gets the win with the Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go, but Bray Wyatt comes out and hits him with the Venus de Milo. Sister Abigail, sorry. Just thinking about another female character that was damaging to the Ninja Turtles. The WWE Tag Team Championship is on the line in a rematch from Extreme Rules. Dyson Kinetic and Segata Sanchiro versus, for me, it was Tuesday. During the match, Jerry Lawler is very focused on the action. Speaking now. of negativity, what about Tyson Kidd and Natalia? Did their loss, did the tag team titles loss have any effect on their, were their so-called marriage? Yes, Jerry Lawler is clearly the authority on what constitutes a successful marriage. Thanks for your input, King. A thrilling battle takes place, but the match ends in disqualification the moment the creative team realizes that the fans are getting excited by the tag team division. Backstage, Cameron is running down Brie Bella, which makes Nikki Bella experience an emotion that somewhat resembles... An emotion! So much so, a horrifying truth is revealed. What you don't understand is that when you talk about my sister, you're talking about me. Wait now, the, the Bellas aren't twins? They're clones? I think Summer Rae has some erotic fan fiction to write. This leads to a match, but first we hear some harsh truths about the Bellas from Naomi. In the real world, the nice, the polite, they fail. Of course, because if there's any pair of women that embodies nice and polite, it's the Bellas. I mean, if you forget about the months and months and months and months and months of TV where they've been portrayed as mean and unlikable. Luckily, as a member of the WWE Universe, I forget about things moments after I've seen them. Wait, what the? When did these women get in the ring? Where am I? 
And why do I suddenly need to take a piss? Nikki Bella gets the win, and we can all move on with our lives. Finally, we reach the main event, where Seth Rollins will go up against Dean Ambrose in a battle of former S.H.I.E.L.D. members slash Roman Reigns carriers. Kane comes out at ringside to distract us with his pointy nipples. Of course, this inevitably leads to Seth knocking into him, and when Kane lashes out, the ref is having none of it. Ambrose, Ambrose! I will disqualify you, come on! I'll disqualify you, come on! Yes, Kane, you'd better watch yourself. Otherwise, he'll have to disqualify you from the match that you're not actually in. The match comes to an end when Seth hits Dean with a DDT. Oh, sorry, he's putting an S at the beginning of his moves now. <laughs> Seth gives Dean a nasty STD. I mean, SDT. There, much better. Speaking of SDTs, Roman Reigns comes to Dean Ambrose's AIDS. Sorry. Aid. The next week, Raw comes to us from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, site of the controversial 1997 Survivor Series pay-per-view. To this very day, people still debate as to whether the Truth Division versus the DOA actually constituted a wrestling match. But we may never know the real story. Stinky Whizzleteats comes to the ring, and in the crowd, The Simpsons' Harry Shearer holds up his resume, hoping that somebody will take pity on him and give him a job as a wrestling manager. The announced team remembers that they were supposed to do actual commentary last week, so they spend the first 10 minutes recapping all that stuff. JBL complains that a triple threat main event isn't fair, as the champion doesn't have to be involved in the pinfall to lose his title. This is in contrast to the last 12 months of TV, where the champion didn't have to be on the show to retain his title. Booker T explains why he's allowed on commentary. This is a WWE, nothing is fair. Randy Orton's haikus need some work. Payback. Payback, payback. Randy Orton announces to the crowd that Roman Reigns has officially been added to the payback main event. And everybody boos because Roman Reigns should be in every match, not just the main event. WWE fans love that robot. They just want to comb his hair and tell him that he's pretty. I know I do anyway. Randy says Roman is going to experience bitter disappointment. Oh, so Randy's going to force him to sit down and watch a montage of his entire career? It would actually make a pretty good pay-per-view name, by the way. This November, the WWE... WWE Network brings you bitter disappointment for only $9.99 with a handicap match of John Cena versus Bray Wyatt, Goldust, and Cesaro. Experience bitter disappointment live. But that's not Randy's problem. But that's not my problem. That's not my problem. That is not my problem. Bloomin' Onion comes out to respond and he manages to be about as intimidating as a child in a beauty pageant. Yeah, all that stuff you just said. It's not going down like that. Write my character to sound like one of those shitty, non-threatening bullies from a Disney Channel original movie, please. The crowd starts chanting the letters RKO, which clearly stands for Roman Kill Orton, with the added implication that they really, really like Roman Reigns. A lot. The wrestling ring transforms into a high school locker room. And just to make something clear, they don't fight for you. Ooh. Fight! 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 I can't wait for Randy to start pulling on Roman's pigtails while calling him a skank. Randy asks Roman if he thinks he's just going to stand there in the ring while Roman beats up Seth, which causes Roman to slap his forehead and go, Oh shit, that's right, you're not the big show. The light bickering intensifies. I don't care what you do, you can stand anywhere, but if you come near me, you won't. Be standing. But only because you'll trip and fall on all the grease that is oozing from Roman's hair and leaking onto the mat. Randy whips out his cock and compares it to Roman's when suddenly Roman's penis Superman punches Randy's and gives it a spear before we can learn whose is bigger. It's quite something. Roman snipes back, pointing out that he beat Randy in a SummerSlam match that was so memorable that this is the first time anybody has talked about it since. In fact, while it was happening, nobody was talking about it. But that's pretty typical for WWE's commentary team. Roman says that at payback, he's going to become the next WWE champion, and everybody boos because he should be champion right now, damn it! And so should his cock! Speaking of cocky champions, the New Day come out and complain about all the negativity, saying it has to stop. Meanwhile, Vince McMahon is watching, wondering when they hired three Shelton Benjamins. Xavier Woods refers to this segment as the Montreal boo-hoo job, when in 
actuality, it's the Montreal boo-hoo job because nobody's quite sure who they're supposed to hate, the tag team champions or Roman Reigns. Kofi accuses Randy and Roman of squandering their opportunities, which pisses Randy right off as he's always taken advantage of every opportunity given to him. After all, his motto is be all that you can be unless you don't want to. Big E says that today, Roman and Randy have the chance to do something positive, something extraordinary. Clap with the new day! Both Roman and Randy are very confused by the concept of clapping, as they haven't heard that sound in well over a year. The New Day announced that they will be taking on Roman and Randy in a handicap match, but then Roman Reigns' cock joins the fray, evening the playing field. Big E is a poet, and he wasn't previously aware of this. Thanks to Kane, you too will feel the pain! I think you'll find that the blame for pain falls mainly on the Reigns. The match begins, and the announcement team wonders whether Roman and Randy can operate as a team. Which is crazy, as Randy has proven to be the ultimate team player, and Roman Reigns has proved over the last several months that anybody who sees him immediately likes him and can locate no flaw in his personality. Michael Cole makes reference to last week's historic app vote. Yes, he actually uses that word. Historic. Decades from now, we will sit down with our grandchildren and regale them with stories about where we were when it was decided that Seth Rollins would take on two men in a lukewarm pay-per-view event. And then they will look at us and ask, who the fuck is Roman Reigns, Grandpa? And we will say, oh right, that was before the temporal rift opened up and removed him from existence. That was a good day. Booker T struggles with the concept of meals. They're talking about a power hard. This guy lift weights for breakfast. Now Kofi Kingston comes in he, off the tag. What does he do for lunch? That lift weights. Hey, Booker, how does Big E train for matches? Does he eat a salad? Because you seem to have the two confused. During a rest hold, the crowd starts chanting for JBL as he also puts people to sleep. The crowd are so into the match that kicks off the lowest rated Raw of the year so far that they start chanting for a man who turned his back on his peers and left. And then they stop cheering for Randy Orton and they start chanting for CM Punk. Randy psychs himself up to hit the RKO and then Booker T and JBL psych themselves up for their trip to Disney World. World. There we go. We're going to that special, special place. Roman Reigns accidentally does something interesting and spears Randy Orton, allowing Kofi to get the pinfall. Later on in the night, the New Day celebrate their victory by going to a fancy restaurant where they lift 300 pounds in weights. They later starve to death, which is really weird as they made sure to lift weights three times a day. Kane, you feel the love tonight, comes out and demands everybody's undivided attention, which confuses the hell out of the announce team as their job is to focus on literally anything that isn't what's happening right now. Kane has noticed that Randy and Roman have a mutual dislike of each other, and Kane wants to exaggerate it, which means once Kane's wrestling career is over, he has a perfectly good job waiting for him, writing for the dirt sheets. Kane does his best impression of Vince McMahon when someone taller than six foot two walks into his office. I don't want to squash that. I want to ex exploit that. Kane announces that Roman and Randy will go one-on-one -on -one in tonight's main event to decide who has worn out the most welcome. Backstage, Seth confronting rolls Kane for a good five minutes and compares him to the bad kid trying to get into Santa's good graces at the last minute. Coming soon from WWE Films, The Polar Express 2, starring Kane. Just so long as it ends with Kane choke slamming terrifying CGI Tom Hanks, I'll be there opening night. Kane says he has trouble relating to the analogy, as he was never really close to Santa. Which is fine with Santa, as the last few times a wrestler came close to him, we ended up with Santa with muscles and Santa's sleigh. We also got Mick Foley's heartwarming I Am Santa documentary, which left a lot of wrestling fans disappointed that we didn't see Santa get chokeslammed through a chimney onto a bed of flaming thumbtacks. Kane makes a match between Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins, with J&J &J security barred from ringside. Which is of course wrestling code for J&J &J security will definitely get involved in the match. In fact, don't be surprised if they are the only participants. Even without the need for his voice box, Kane still struggles with the whole talking thing. Well, if you prefer... The WWE Universe once again proves that it can count just fine. Say one word. 
and the WWE's YouTube subscriber count is higher than RVD in the first week of April. Michael Cole announces that they've already had over 2 billion views on their YouTube channel this year. Although, to be fair, 1.5 billion of those views come from people clicking on Roman Reigns' face, thinking that it's the new Aquaman movie trailer. Ryback addresses his fan base. Montreal, you sound hungry! Actually, we already ate a big pile of overhyped bullshit. Couldn't take another bite, sorry. Renee Young tries to interview Ryback, but he ends up dropping her on the concrete instead of responding. Ryback is goaded by the crowd as they start chanting Goldberg at him, but he takes it in stride and is able to coherently finish his promo. Oh, sorry, I must have misread that. No, sorry. It turns out he gets really confused and flustered and fucks everything up. All my life, I've had to face fear. The big guy loves you guy too! <laughs> That's the sweetest thing you guy have ever said to me. Ryback delivers one of the most confusing inspirational speeches I've ever heard. If you ignore it, you just keep doing it! Ah yes, the original translation of the Latin phrase, cogito ergo suplex. Ryback tells his sad story. Top doctors told me I would never wrestle. Oh, a surprisingly accurate diagnosis then. Ryback says he eats fear and negativity. Does nobody in the WWE eat actual food? Ryback makes his message plain. So listen up. Listen very clearfully, Bray. Well, you can't get more clearful than that, can you? Bray Wyatt takes a break from playing with the smoke machine backstage to address Ryback, and he makes it clear that he's feuding with Ryback because... Bray has been unlocking all of the achievements in Prototype. This inhuman world makes human monster. Cesaro and Tyson Kidd take on the Ascension, who still don't get me very excited, even though they're essentially ripped straight out of Mad Max. And if you didn't go see Mad Max yet, go see Mad Max. Seriously, I'll wait. Welcome back, wasn't that cool? Okay, so yeah, the Ascension are kind of shit. Tyson Kidd thinks that being married to a heart makes him a part of the Heart Foundation. Really? It just makes him a wannabe, like the rest of the Heart Dynasty. Unlike the guys dressed like the Legion of Doom, who are 100% legit. JBL mentions that Stu Hart would have been 100 years old the other day. Speaking of which, JBL's humor is about the same age. The commentary team starts talking about the Stanley Cup, and they go into more detail about that than they ever have with a single wrestling match. Booker T has clearly been studying his geography. This guy's a Roman, man. He doesn't know his own shit. I've never seen this guy work He's out in the gym. Not to be confused with Booker T's other favorite wrestling Wrestler, Swissman Reigns. Cesaro manhandles Victor, and the crowd is really into it. Although, as Vince McMahon quite rightly points out, Cesaro comes from a place that isn't this place, so he doesn't deserve to be pushed. Tyson Kidd gets the pin, and Booker is definitely paying attention. New Day better not get too cocky because the former tag team champs are still in perfect form. Talking about Natalia? Yes, Natalia is clearly the tag team champs. Duh. Oh wait, I see. You were making a joke about how a woman is physically attractive, and that's all that matters. I get it now, Booker. Good one. Seth Cornerings is rolled by Renee Young, and he complains that there is no point to his match with Dean Ambrose. Speaking of no point, that's about how many Raw got in the ratings this week. Seth Summings rolls up Kane's character development. Kane is a moron. Dean Ambrose's bulging cheeks takes on Seth Rollins' cheeky bulges, and we learn that this week, Raw is sponsored by Popeyes' $5 bona fide big box. Blatant bullshit buzzwords by bumbling bigwig buffoons bring blisters to my bollocks. Alliteration, bitches. Raw is also sponsored by Just For Men. Speaking of Just For Men, Vince McMahon's concept of the WWE. Booker T is a spokesperson. And by new turtle wax eyes with smart shield technology, protect the body, free the soul. 
Bespoke is a relative term. Dean Ambrose has played way too much Legacy of Cain. Ambrose looking to free the soul here tonight. Everyone is shocked when Cain comes out and actually furthers the plot, announcing that if Dean wins this match, he will be added to the payback main event. Seth Rollins argues that the WWE Universe voted for a triple threat, which only bolsters Kane's decision, as he is a walking example of not giving the WWE fans what they want. Animated Disney chipmunk Dean Ambrose addresses the crowd with squeaks and grunts, and nobody understands what the fuck he's saying, but they all think it's adorable, so they support it anyway. Seth insistings rules that Canada's opinion doesn't count, which is ridiculous, as Canada were amongst the first people to herald Tom Green as an actual comedian, and clearly, that opinion has remained valid. Ex-Rescue Ranger Dean Ambrose spends the first 10 minutes of the match toying with Seth, and the crowd wonders if Dean has mistaken Seth for a nut and is trying to store him in his mouth. Meanwhile, Booker T describes Dean Ambrose as a throwback to wrestlers of the past. And if that's not the best compliment you've ever heard, I don't know what is. Comparing him to things from 30 years ago. Way to make him seem like a contender for today's WWE main event picture. He's as impressive as Hercules. Not the Greek god, the shitty old school wrestler, who was shit. That's a good thing, apparently. Booker T is confused by Dean's wardrobe. He is unique. You think? He showed up in a pair of jeans, ready to fight. Uh, he usually dresses in jeans, but... Yeah. Booker T has apparently never paid attention to Dean Ambrose while he wrestles until this very night. Which is perfectly okay as neither has Vince. Also, wrestling in jeans is extremely unique. Nobody has ever done that before. It's very unorthodox to do so. Dean is quite the trendsetter. The crowd begins chanting for Sami Zayn, and JBL asks if they're in an alternate universe. Yes, an alternate universe where people are excited to see new wrestling talent. That's clearly not the world we live in, where people just want to see more Big Show matches. In fact, why not just rebrand Brand Raw to the Big Show show. Show. Dean and Seth collide in a battle for the ages, in one of the best wrestling matches we've seen on TV in quite some time, with implications for the upcoming pay-per-view main event. So of course, JBL makes this historic call. Wow, it's, hey, it's May the 4th. Kick. It's May the 4th be with you. And if you think he's excited for May 4th, wait till you see how excited he gets for Cinco de Mayo, which of course is Spanish for the traditional Mexican holiday of your eliminated. J and J security interfere in the match where the only stipulation is that they cannot do that. And of course, nobody does anything to stop it. Speaking of things that shouldn't be able to happen, Dean Ambrose wins the match and puts himself in the pay-per-view main event. The crowd goes nuts, and even JBL can't contain his excitement. It's May the 4th be with you. JBL's commentary is the real reason that Anakin turned to the dark side. Kane is... He's calling his people! Oh, so now you describe what's happening. And then Seth Rollins rushes in and demands to know if Kane is trying to kill him. This would add to Kane's long list of kills, including Katie Vick, his own career, and the TV ratings. Byron Saxton interviews Lana and asks her how it felt to be liked by people, because he's yet to experience that himself. Then Fandango shows up and tells her not to make Dynasty Warriors. Lana. Don't be coy. Fandango pretends to be comfortable with his role as a real-life wrestling meme, and then Miz and Mizdow come out to continue their great storyline, where one of them is extremely liked by the crowd, and the other one doesn't appreciate that. Oh wait, sorry, it's not actually Miz and Mizdow. They've just transferred their angle to Lana and Rusev. Miz and Mizdow aren't actually on TV anymore. Because that's how storytelling works. Fandango tries to get Lana to do the Fandango with him. Lana Moosh, Lana Moosh, will she do the Fandango? It turns out yes, and it's fucking adorable. But unfortunately, it's a grim Fandango, as Lana gets sent backstage by Rusev as a result. Rusev puts Fandango in the accolade, which prevents him from pointing, rendering his powers useless. There's an ESPN feature on the WWE, showing the real stories of wrestlers, including an affecting look at the life of Adam 
Adam Rose, a man who has had to struggle through tragedy and adversity to attain both respect and success despite insurmountable odds. Here he is wrestling with a man in a bunny costume. The commentary team applies defibrillators to people's waning excitement for Tough Enough. Anybody can submit their own video entries, including this plastic action figure that has taken on a life of its own. Here are some examples. I can get really, really angry or I can be just pretty much the nicest guy in the world. I have emotions. Let me be on the television. I know I got the charisma, baby, yeah. As we all know, yelling incoherently equals charisma. That's why Scott Steiner is the most charismatic wrestler on the planet. I would tell you I'd push myself to the limits, but I have no limits. I even have the unlimited capacity to suck. I will outsmart anyone, and most of all, I will outheart anyone. Because I'm part of the world's greatest heart cover band. Put me on the television! A deluded idiot whose career is going nowhere takes on that same thing that I just said. Stardust comes to the ring carrying some bells he found while shaking trees in his Animal Crossing village and Michael Cole reacts. John, that looks like one of those grab bags you get when you visit the Hayden Planetarium. The most detailed description in wrestling commentary history and it's on a fucking bag. Stardust makes a Star Wars reference. As I exact my revenge on that womp rat, our truth Presumably by bullseyeing him in his T-16 in Beggar's Canyon. Everyone chants Cody, because they're huge fans of the sweet life, but they only like the one main character. The announcers theorize as to what could be in Stardust's bag. Jake the Snake used to keep a, a snake in the bag. Maybe it's a snake. Booker T used to have credibility. Maybe it's Booker T's credibility. Our truth looks inside the bag because when you are wrestling a professional wrestler, you should certainly concern yourself with such extraneous details as that. And it turns out that the bag is filled with fake plastic spiders. What is my fucking life? Michael Cole insists that our truth is deathly afraid of spiders, even though this happened. Oh, I fear oh, my fear of spiders, dog. You know what I'm saying? No, arachophobia is fear of heights, oh. truth. Then again, our truth also insisted that he was deathly afraid of heights, and that never developed into anything either. So maybe he just lives in Seamus's mirror universe, where it's perpetually opposite day. Michael Cole does his best to make sure our truth retains his dignity and remains a credible threat. A grown man is running away from plastic spiders. Or not, I guess. Who will answer John Cena's open challenge? It certainly couldn't be Sami Zayn, who the crowd has been chanting for for the last two hours. That would be silly. Following Raw, there will be a brand new episode of WWE 24 called Roman Reigns Forever Alone. Oh, sorry. Roman Reigns Never Alone. Because he will always be haunted by the boos that follow him wherever he goes. John Cena comes out and the crowd gives him the warmest possible reception in Canada at minus 97 degrees. In other words, they shit all over him. Cena does his best impression of CM Punk as seen through the eyes of Vince McMahon. I quit. Everyone starts chanting ole, 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 which confuses the hell out of the announcers as Los Matadores aren't even in the ring. John Cena believes his next challenger might be Jay Sherman. Whether you are a critic or an opponent, I never give up. John Cena awaits his mystery opponent, which turns out to be Bret Hart's years of resentment and sadness. Cena says there's no way he could defeat such a powerful opponent, so Bret Hart brings out Sami Zayn instead. Sami ends up needing medical attention about 60 seconds into the match, as nobody thought while booking the match that Sami Zayn's talent couldn't survive in such close proximity to the talentless vacuum known as John Cena. If only they'd been more clearful! John Cena ends up winning the match against the injured young up-and-comer, which just does wonders for Sami Zayn's career, oh boy, let me tell you, and then Booker T passes judgment. I said once, I said again, John Cena is the guy. But wait, I thought Kofi Kingston was the guy. There can't possibly be two guys, Booker. It's just not logical. Unlike your usual statements, which tend to hold up just fine. Next, you'll be telling me that Kofi didn't do it here in the WWE. Try the WWE Network for free in the month of 
May because, you know, fuck everybody else who's been paying for it this whole time. The New Day are the nation of domination as written by Dr. Seuss, and then Cesaro, Tyson Kidd, and Natalia show up and make fun of the New Day because nobody likes them. Please donate to Stephanie McMahon's anti-bullying campaign, by the way. Speaking of people who flip-flop on the whole bullying thing, the Bellas come out to be cheered and or booed. Because who the fuck knows at this point? Maybe we should cheer-boo them. Yay! Suddenly, Naomi and Tamina attack the Bellas from behind, preventing this Divas match from happening, causing people to have to hold their urine for the next 30 minutes at least. Those heelish bitches! Booker T says that the Ascension had better watch their backs with Tamina and Naomi around. You say that like the Ascension hasn't already been made to look weaker than the entire Divas division. King Barrett addresses the crowd with the words, Hear ye, hear ye ye, which is actually what the town crier would say, not the fucking king of England. Speaking of criers, the WWE universe when they realize they have to watch yet another fucking tag team match. Sheamus and Barrett team up against Neville, the man that gravity forgot, and Dolph Ziggler, the man the company forgot. Booker T is Booker T. It's no way to treat a king, but very exciting. Hello, king. Hello, Booker. Barrett uses his finisher, now renamed the Royal Bullhammer, to finish this royally bull Bullshit match. The Raw main event is Roman Reigns versus Randy Orton. Until, of course, sports entertainment happens, which leads to nothing either sportsworthy or entertaining. The authority threatened to take control of the match, with J&J security acting as timekeeper and ring announcer. Booker T keeps referring to them as the Lollipop Gang, which I can only assume is the urban version of the Lollipop Guild, who do drive-by shootings on the Yellow Brick Road. The crowd then silences itself as Roman and Randy both hit their finishers because they are holding their breath in anticipation, not because they're bored as fuck and they can predict what's going to happen. The match just kind of stops happening and then everybody attacks everybody until Dean Ambrose shows up and sings a happy song about how great it is to be a chipmunk with so many friends. On same old shit down, fuck all happens. Except that people sign a contract which states that eventually shit will happen. Just not today. Next week, Raw opens in Cincinnati, where a limo carrying Triple H's ego kicks off the show. Vince McHelmsley saunters to the ring and attempts to seduce the audience with creepy one-liners. Daddy's home. After the nuclear outrage on Tumblr has settled, Triple H calls out Kane and Seth Rofflings to discuss the undermining of his authority while he's been gone. And despite retaining the title at Extreme Rules, Booker T has a different perspective on reality and the space-time continuum. You know, let me just say, Seth Rollins used to be champion. Booker T! Scholar of our time. What proceeds next is a flurry of finger pointing and name calling that would give Total Divas a run for their money. Speaking of Total Divas and money, you would have to pay me a lot of that to make me watch Total Divas. Daddy Helmsley silences both Kane and Seth by cradling them in his fatherly bosom, assuring them that all four participants in the main event at Payback will see action tonight. Kane will face a real doll version of Roman Reigns, Seth will face Randy Orton, Again? And Cincinnati's favorite son, hero to the people and most wanted superstar of the night, Dean Ambrose, will face J and J security. That is the kind of prestige that every wrestler should strive to achieve. Wrestling J and J security. The announced team pays tribute to one of the number one contenders for the WWE heavyweight title by measuring each other's dick size and saying who could beat up who during his match. You could get in the ring with Ambrose right now. So what you telling me, well, I Cole? I could, but I'm not, because I'm warning here at, my, at the commentary. Cole, you telling me you could whoop Judd right now, is what you're saying. Ooh, you. You're the one guy I'm sure I could whoop, Michael. Dean Ambrose wins his match, and Booker T demonstrates even more of his reality-warping powers. <laughs> We got a new champ. Sheamus comes out to commentate on the next match. Remember when we all missed Sheamus? Well, now he's here. All the time. Dolph Ziggler takes on Bad News Barrett and almost takes him out with a super kick, but unfortunately King Barrett's royal bullhammer was far too thick and meaty, and he loses the match after interference from Sheamus, who unfortunately has not recovered from taking 11 hits of acid at Burning Man and still believes himself to be Russell Crowe. Ironically, most of Russell Crowe's rap parties are much more violent than most of Sheamus' matches. WWE Tough Enough is still returning, and rumor has it that they're bringing back Bill 
build a mod to train some of the newcomers. Let's look at a sneak peek at the new season of the show. Private Pile, I'm gonna give you three seconds. Exactly three fucking seconds to wipe that stupid looking grin off your face or I will gouge out your eyeballs and skull fuck you! Luke Harper and Eric Rowan are tag teaming again because as Vince McMahon always said, if it ain't broke, keep doing it over and over again until it fucking breaks, you dumb fuck. Fandango makes his way to the stage and is beaten in 35.88 seconds. I'm not even joking, the commentators were actually betting on how long it would take for them to beat him. Cause that's how you push wrestlers, point out that they're shit. A breath of fresh air makes his way out to the ring. Oops, no, that's John Cena again. The WWE has finally found a way to guilt its fans in into cheering for Cena. It is the United States Championship. That's right, if you don't cheer for Cena, you're a filthy communist, or a terrorist, or a filthy terror communist, or whatever thing that America wants you to hate these days. Neville isn't afraid of backing down from John Cena's open challenge, because when both your parents have been driven to insanity by Death Eaters, there's really nothing left to fear. A surprisingly well put together match between the two superstars is interrupted by Rusev, because God forbid we're allowed to enjoy a spectacular wrestling performance when there's this this stale feud still happening. Rusev takes Neville off guard as he's about to win the United States Championship and hits him with a super kick. A lot of super kicks going around these days. Rusev puts Cena in the accolade. Again. And he passes out. Again. Look, I'll just sum up this entire feud with this. Kane and an artist's interpretation of Roman Reigns wrestle for a good three minutes at least until Roman Reigns hits Kane with a sloppy spear over the announce table, even though Kane used to kick out of The Undertaker's tombstone. But of course we don't talk about that Kane. We don't talk about the good Kane. Newly baby-faced and extremely sympathetic Brie Bella is going up against Tamina Snooker. And of course people would root for the Bellas in this situation, because Tamina and Naomi were just bullying them last week. And the Bellas are complete strangers to that sort of thing. Bullying and all. They don't do that. Never. Tamina wins the match with a super kick. Axel Mania is running in a circle because it only has one leg to stand on. Except now it also has Damien Sandow too! Look, I could actually make fun of what happened, or you could just watch the clip. He's a one-trick pony, brother! Macho Mandow, oh yeah! How about this tonight? Sky's the limit, space is the place! You and me in the ring, toe to toe, face to face, dig it! This actually happened. This clip exists. Still somehow the best storyline going in the WWE right now. Axel Mania and Macho Mandau meet in the center of the ring. As the hypest match in recent memory is about to take place, who but the Ascension would walk down to the ring right now? The misshapen, tentacled offspring of the Acolytes and the Road Warriors call out Macho Mandau and Axel Mania for being delusional wrestlers who dress up and play make-believe. Yes, the irony is suffocating, isn't it? It. Speaking of suffocating, that's what these gimmicks are doing to these careers. The Ascension storm the ring only to be completely annihilated by the newly reformed Mega Powers. Curtis Axel even manages to drop the big leg. I must have gotten into Seamus' stash of LSD because this suddenly turned into the best angle ever. In before this story is completely buried in two weeks. Next up, Daniel Bryan comes out to explain the extent of his injuries. And since this segment is extremely sad and depressing, I'd rather not make fun of it directly. So instead, here's my wife with a demonstration of what happened. Yes! 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 <laughs> ah. Thank you, honey. Very respectful. Today we get to see half of the entire tag team division at ringside. And by that, I mean the New Day and Tyson Kidd and Cesaro. And by that, I mean the entire tag team division. Cesaro picks up the win in the match as the New Day were too distracted by Xavier Woods' face doing this to do any wrestling. The hell is that? The primetime players attempt to mock the New Age Outlaws. Why? Now if you ain't down with that, we got three words for you. Millions of dollars! 
Monty Python Eat Your Heart Out. Bray Wyatt cuts one of his existential mad libs on Ryback. The colorfully dressed Ronald McDonald lookalike storms the ring and beats the piss out of Bray Wyatt. That's the sound of Bray Wyatt's career deflating as we speak. Randy Orton versus Seth Ings. The most anticipated Randy Orton versus Seth Rollins match since the last five. Seth Rollins almost gets a pin with another fucking super kick. Jeez, are you fucking kidding me? Kane, who is always excited at the prospect of standing around doing nothing, comes down to the ring so that he can stand around and do nothing. And then we close out the show with Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose beating the crap out of Seth Rollins. Hey look, it's that triple threat match with the shield that we wanted five years ago. Smackdown kicks off with a mind-bending Bray Wyatt promo, followed by a mind-numbing Roman Reigns promo. Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns stare passionately into each other's eyes after discussing the size of their finishing moves. After awkwardly shipping the two, Kane tells Dean that he has a match with Sheamus. Monsieur Lunatique and the comfortably pale Celtic warrior go at each other until Seamus's painfully un-aerodynamic mohawk causes him to crash headfirst into the ring post, costing him the match. Seth Rollins reminds Kane for the 480,706th time that if Seth leaves payback without his title, Kane will be fired. Kane responds with his equivalent of screw the rules I have money and tells Rollins that he's got a match tonight with Ryback. Oh Kane, always responding to clever quips by sending large sweaty men after the quipper. Rusev Storm Rage has words for John Cena. You, Cena, were not prepared. After a longer than necessary segment where Rusev forces Lana to apologize for her actions and then proceeds to tell us that John Cena will say I quit in every conceivable manner, finally ending a gibbering Russian mess in the middle of the ring. You don't need to tell us that John Cena has to say I quit, Rusev. It's an I quit match. Tis thusly implied. It's like spending four weeks saying the words, you are going to be pinned, leading up to a regular match. Or the announcers saying, you are going to be very disappointed, leading up to every pay-per-view. We understand what we're getting ourselves in for. Ryback says in an interview that he's not very smart, but he can hurt people real good. See, when CM Punk says that exact thing, he gets lambasted by critics. And yet when Ryback says it about himself, He's bragging. Ladies and gentlemen, future WWE Hall of Famer, Gabriel Iglesias. They call me fluffy, but I'm anything but soft. Seth Rollins comes out and reminds us for the infinity earth plus one time that he's quite upset about being beaten up on Raw. He claims that he's not the only evil character going into the match at Payback. Sure, Rollins is neutral evil, but he also claims that Roman Reigns is lawful evil and Ambrose is clearly chaotic evil. While Randy Orton is only kind of true neutral on account of his blandness. Try not to mention how he crit failed joining the military. It's very upset. Ryback's music hits, interrupting Seth Rollins' D&D character style interpretation of the S.H.I.E.L.D. members. As the Silverback heads down mid lane hoping to get fed, he gets ambushed by Bray Wyatt. Ryback lies concussed on the ground, even though the replay clearly shows he did not hit his head. Although as we all know, his brain is not located there anyway. Bravely, the uninjured yet still kind of injured, I guess, Ryback calls for the match to continue. See, if Ryback, the large, muscular, roided up freak can fight, so can you, average Joe WWE fan. It's inspirational, trust me. After stumbling around the ring with phantom concussion syndrome, Ryback takes two super kicks to the face and is pinned by the champion. Fuck is with the super kicks. Naomi has some sort of interview, but more importantly, flirts with Renee Young. Sometimes a good girl gotta be bad in order to get things done. Still less sexual tension than there was between Dean and Roman. This time, the other half of the tag team division, oh, it's the same half. Tyson Kidd takes on Kofi Kingston, who proves that he is no longer the guy and has not done it here in the WWE by losing clean. So much for being the guy, Kofi. We believed in you, Kofi, and you let us down. Now we have a new the guy, and his name is John Cena. Bo Dallas does his best Mickey Mouse impression. Oh, you have to do is believe. The Earth couldn't handle the announcement of yet another season of Honey Boo Boo and has to be destroyed. 
And also Neville comes out. He takes on Squeaky the Clown. King Barrett joins the announced team to lecture Jerry Lawler on how he earned the title of king, unlike Jerry. I think you'll find that Jerry has earned the undisputed title of King of Dad Humor. After Neville wins the match, King Barrett gets on top of the announce table and waggles his scepter at him. I feel like I've watched less uncomfortable My Little Pony pornography. Adabra! Adam Rose is beating his meat. And then he makes out with Rosa Mendez. See, usually I would do those the other way round, but what do I know? In a unique twist, Kane takes on Roman Reigns. And by twist, I mean that's what the knife is doing in my back because the WWE creative team have expected me to once again take this. Unlike on Raw, the two actually make it into the ring at some point. But then they're like, okay, what do we do now? I, I forget. A table spears Kane through the Roman Reigns. Sorry, no, the other way around. Roman spears Kane through a table. But you can understand my confusion, yeah. Dean Ambrose attacks j and security and Seth Rollins with a plate of cookies. With devastating effects. This brief skirmish ends when Dean Ambrose's hetero life mate Roman Reigns shows up with what looks to be a cart of cleaning supplies. Speaking of clean, the ending to 0% of most matches that matter on TV these days. Smackdown ends with a just kiss moment and then Dean Ambrose places the fallen WWE title on his senpai's show. And that does it for yet another week of homoerotic wrestling. Now in order to counterbalance that, I'm going to go do something extremely manly, like play Splatoon, where I am a small, adorable squid girl. It's fucking great! I'm pink! Haha! <laughs> Randy announces that Roman Reigns has been added to the payback made of head. Booker T is stupid. <laughs> Let's go back in time and watch Booker T's own video entry to W sub to W sub W. After awkwardly shipping the two, is there any other way to ship them?